So this evening, if you haven't guessed it yet, I'm going to talk about fear. <laughs> um, we are to uh, quote the, the song, God's Unchanging Hand, moving through a time of swift transition, are we not? There are lots of times of swift transition upon us. Lots of things are happening right now. Um, we are perhaps going to have to make a number of challenging decisions in the future um, about the coming year. Um, and I think there's some kind of realization, too, on some level, that things are not going to necessarily be going back to normal anytime soon, and who knows if ever, right? Um, even though the vaccine is available, or, or becoming available, there are still many states that are promising to be closed for the middle of next year, you know, then they are going to start removing restrictions. And, and, and that is contingent upon a bunch of other things. So as much as we have hope that it's over, a lot of times, uh, a lot of things and indications uh, that are out there are that it isn't. Um, and, and I think there's been so many changes, so many disruptions in society that it is impossible to imagine that the landscape of our lives right now and our country will be anything like what it would have been before had we not been subject to so many things that have happened this year. Um, drastic, substantive changes uh, will continue to take place. And, and I think what that happened, with that, all that happening, all these changes, all these adaptations that we're having to get used to, there is a negative effect on our psyche if we allow it to kind of get to us. And it's a stimulus or a temptation to be afraid, to fear, live in fear. Because people don't like to change. If they're called on to change, a lot of people are happy to just continue to go as they've been always doing things, right? Um, we like to find a nice little niche <laughs> and kind of stay there, don't we? Um, talking about fear, though, not all fear is bad. As a matter of fact, there's some fear that is good. Um, some types are good and some types are evil. And I want to give us some examples about both of those because the good type of fear helps us with the bad kind. Um, let's let's first look at a good type of fear, and that is the admiration for God and of Jesus. And um, this would be considered healthy or righteous fear, right? Job twenty eight twenty eight says. And to man, he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. Right? This type of fear is not the type that is anxiety-inducing. It is not cowering in your basement or screaming irrationally, uh, trying to hide under your covers. Right? <laughs> it's not that kind of fear, right? The righteous fear is actually an antidote against the fear that is that way, that is sinful. Um, so what, is, what does this fear look like? Well, it's not the same kind of fear, but what does it look like? Well, I was having a hard time kind of thinking of an example, but what I thought of was this. I don't know if you've ever stood like in front of something like a truly majestic scene, like a mountain, just towering over you, and you just have that sense of humility uh, in the presence of something so awesome and amazing and almost terrible in a good way. You know, just the power that's in front of you, the forces of nature. Uh, and, and that is the type of fear that we have when we think about God, something, someone who is great and powerful and majestic and truly awesome in any way that we can possibly imagine. And, and the one who created that mountain. Um, and to give us maybe a sense of how powerful and magnificent God is, um, I would like to share with you a little passage from Job uh, 38, 1 through 7. This is just the beginning, and it goes on and on about God's power. But you get an idea from the beginning. 
It says, then the Lord answered Job from the whirlwind, right? From like a tornado, right? And said, who is this who darkens the divine plan by words without knowledge? Now tighten the, tighten the belt on your waist like a man, and I shall ask you, and you shall inform me. Where were you when I laid the foundation of the earth? Tell me, if you have understanding. Who set its measurements, since you know? Or who stretched the measuring line over it? On what were its bases sunk? Or who laid its cornerstone? When the morning stars sang together, and all the sons of God shouted for joy. You can imagine, you know, you get a little bit of a picture of the creation of the earth, you know, and the, the angels singing and the power of everything that's happening at that moment when he's talking to Job like this roar out of a whirlwind, you know. You can just imagine how powerful the voice would have to be to just go right through what a tornado would be, right? <laughs> I mean, it's, it's, it sounds amazing. Um, and totally awesome. You know, if you put yourself in that position, I think you would be a little bit nervous, right? And just like respectful and humble by the power and magnificence that you saw. And that is the fear of God, having that healthy respect, having that humility to understand and to defer to his will for your life. That is the fear of God. You know, this is only the beginning, too, of the passage, and I, and I encourage you to read um, Job 38 through 40, and it's the whole thing, and you really get a sense of who God is, his power, right? It's like seeing, when, you know, when you see an iceberg on the ocean, and you're like, oh, that thing is huge. Well, that's only usually 10% of it is above the water, and the, the other 90% is underneath the water. That's like God. We're seeing a little 10% sticking up above the water, but it's so much deeper and bigger and more magnificent than that. So having this humble and respectful fear for God is healthy and righteous, and it has the added benefit of being a bulwark against the fear that is sinful and evil. Because you see, Satan also uses fear um, for wicked ends. Satan twists our fear and leads us into paths of craven, uh, a craven mind and an irrational behavior. Fear of the future and the unknown are good examples of what many people worry about in a sinful way. People want control over their own destinies and their futures, and Satan tempts us into thinking that we can have control over those things. And it, but it's really an illusion that is constantly, constantly being challenged over and over again, causing us to have worry and stress and more fear. Because it is only an illusion. And it's kind of like when you're watching a movie and you think that and you're totally invested in the movie and the storyline and everything that's happened and, and accidentally... You see a coffee cup on the on the on the table, and it's supposed to be like some kind of medieval fantasy or whatever. Or there's a camera guy in the background wearing a t-shirt and jeans, and everybody else is wearing armor. You know, it 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 breaks the 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 illusion. You're like, oh, th this isn't real. Well, the same thing happens to us when. We think that we can control our own destinies. If we just have enough money and we just have enough resources, we just have enough of this or that, then I can control it all. But then reality pokes itself in. And Satan knows that reality will cause us more fear, more worry, and more rejection. Every time our false sense of security is challenged, every time that we have a sense that we are losing control of our life, we start to succumb to unrighteousness and sinful Fear, we sense that we are losing control, even though in reality we never actually had it. And you see, if you have the fear of the Lord and you understand your place in the universe and that humility like that present in the being in the presence of something so awesome and fantastic as, as is God, then we, know, we don't have to worry about ourselves. We don't have to depend on ourselves. We're depending on someone much stronger than us.
right? So Jesus points out this reaction, though, that we have with irrational fear, the breaking of our reality when he talks about it in Luke 12, 25 through 26. He says, And which of you, by worrying, can add a single hour to his lifespan? If then you cannot do even a very little thing, why do you worry about other matters? He's saying, why? What, what can you do? You don't have control, right? There's nothing you can do. So if you're worrying about it, worrying, worrying, all this worry, you can't add an hour to your life just by worrying, can you? He said, then why do you think you have any control at all? You don't know what's going to happen to you. It is a sin of pride and arrogance that we assume that we can control our future. And the fact of the matter is that we cannot. We cannot do it. Times of Swiss, swift transition only serve as strong reminders of the limits of our own abilities. Do they not? Things constantly changing all around us and the fact that we can affect no change of our own on those powerful forces that are moving around us. We fear what's around the bend and what the future holds because we believe on some level that we can, in fact, by worrying, add an hour to our lifespan. But we can't. Um, James says, uh, in James 4.14, he says, Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. He says, you, don't, you can't control things. You're, it's not up to you. <laughs> you know, it, I think a lot of times we think we're super important, we can do these things, but we can't. And the reality is, when we get into our car, at any given moment, we could lose total control, get hit by a drunk driver, and that would be the end of it. You know, there's nothing we can do about that. We could stay in our basement, stay there all day, never leave. Never get out from under that. Our control over our life is an illusion. It will always be an illusion. And what does it accomplish to fight with every breath to maintain the next one? How is it good to live a lie? And won't we always be disappointed when we're finally forced to reconcile with what is the truth? These are all things <laughs> that are out there with this fear. You know what, I, I think of it kind of like living on credit cards, right? You have this illusion of massive wealth. So, you know, <laughs> these credit card companies, even if you're dirt poor, they're like, you know what, we're going to give you a, a, a limit of $20,000 on this credit card. And then somebody just, you know, has some QVC binge and goes totally nuts, you know. Does anybody watch QVC anymore? Is that a thing? Amazon, right? <laughs> but uh, they just blow twenty thousand dollars in twenty minutes on Amazon, whatever, and and they have the illusion of all this power and wealth. But then they the money runs out, and then the illusion is over, right? And then comes the reality, which is you owe twenty thousand dollars to this credit card company plus interest. So you actually probably owe, after all the compound interest and everything, fifty thousand dollars, right, or whatever it is. Um, it, that is what it's like to try to control your own life. You have this illusion like you can do things, like you have all this power, like you can influence whatever it is in your life, but in reality, you could die tomorrow. There's nothing you can do about it. And so we're, and every time that reality is challenged, that fake reality is challenged, we have fear, we have worry, we have anxiety. Um, it is a stressful and terrifying prospect to sit in fear, waiting for the inevitable, and having no answers. It is in times like this, though, when we real, need to realize that our hope is not lost, right? That's when our fear in God comes into play. That's when it becomes very important that even though we can't handle the future or what will happen tomorrow, there is someone who can, right? Right? the creator of the universe, someone we should have feared and respected from the start, from the beginning, right? Someone who set the foundations of the world and can speak out of the power of a whirlwind. 
like it says in Job, right? The answer to irrational and sinful fear is the fear of God, respect for God, because God is in control and by His grace, we're extended eternal security. All of us. By the power of God, all of us have the opportunity of eternal life. In God, we should trust. In God, we should rely. And on Him, we must depend. That is essentially the message of Jesus. Seek God first, right? Seek His awesome power and don't get consumed with all the worries that come up in your life. Here, let's look at one more verse or passage about that. It's uh, from Luke 12, 29 through 33, where it says, And do not seek what you will eat and what you will drink, and do not keep worrying, for all these things the nations of the world eagerly seek. But your Father knows you need these things. But seek his kingdom, and these things will be added to you. Do not be afraid, little flock, for your Father has chosen gladly to give you the kingdom. Seek first the Lord, right? Seek first the Lord, his kingdom and his righteousness, as it says in Matthew. Respect him. Live in awesome fear of God, and he will protect you and shepherd you. He will guide your life. He will provide light for you in your darkest hours. He will protect you in the depths of your fear. You just need to let go of yourself. We all do. And latch on to God. Live your life for God instead of for ourselves. And see the change that he will make in your life. Right? Job 28, 28. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom. And to depart from evil is understanding. At this time, I want to offer an invitation. If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ as your Savior, if you're willing to repent of your sins, turn your heart to God, if you're willing to be baptized for the forgiveness of your sins, then you can become a child of God. You can enter the kingdom of God. If you seek first his righteousness, then his salvation is for you. And if that's something that you want to do this evening, then I want to encourage you to come forward this evening as we stand and we sing.